Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Candice, and I'm a member of Alateen. Um, <laughs> wow, uh, I'm so grateful to be here. Uh, I just, I never would have thought, you know, Alateen would bring me to a place where I can, you know, share my story, um, which is neat. And, uh, anyways, uh, so I grew up in a, a family of alcoholics. Um, both my parents were sober longer than you know, I've, I've been alive and I've never seen them drink, but you know, um, there's still that alcoholic behavior, you know, whether the alcoholic is drinking or not. And, um, you know, I had to deal with that. My parents got a divorce, um, when I was 10 years old and I don't know, I, I decided to live with my dad and I, things just started to, to change. I saw, you know, my dad's character defects come out and, um, I guess I hadn't, I hadn't noticed that, you know, parents have flaws too. <laughs> um, you know, I always looked up to them and there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of trust I had with my parents. And after my parents got a divorce, things took a change, took a turn for the worse. And, um, uh, there was an instance where, uh, I was about, I'd say 11 or 12 and, um, I had plans with one of my friends and, um, the plans didn't work out the way I, I thought they would. And, uh, my dad was really frustrated and I, I noticed how he would get frustrated over small things and then, you know, it build up. And, uh, eventually there was a lot of, um, verbal abuse going on. And, um, after a few years after my parents split up, my dad quit going to meetings. Um, so he was what you call a dry drunk. And, um, I had a lot of trouble dealing with it. Um, I didn't know that my dad had a, a problem, an alcoholic problem. Um, I didn't understand really what it was. And, um, you know, there came a time where I was fed up with the verbal abuse as well as the physical abuse. And, um, I started getting into, into some trouble and, uh, I hit my stage of rebellion and, um, I don't know. It was just, it was like, I felt like I had nobody to turn to because I didn't trust my dad anymore. Um, and I, uh, there was, there was, uh, an instance where I got into some trouble with the police and, uh, it had to do with drinking. And that was when my mother took me to an Alateen meeting. So she suggested Alateen and I thought, you know, um, if I, if I go to this Alateen group, maybe I can, you know, change things, you know, I need, I need some change in my life. Um, I'm sick of, I was sick of the, the old, you know, I, I felt afraid in my own home, um, of my dad and, uh, I was really lost. I didn't, I didn't have a God. Um, I didn't have a higher power. I didn't, I didn't feel like I felt really alone. And, um, so it was really tough for me to, dive into the Alateen program, but I knew that, you know, if I wanted things to change, I needed to, you know, do something different. And, um, I really liked how, uh, my first Alateen meeting, I, uh, I came home and I just cried. I didn't talk to anybody. I just sat and listened. I was really quiet and I came home and cried and I told my mom, you know, uh, I want to go back. And it took, it took a lot for me to to, to get me in there. But I was so glad after that first meeting. Um, I mean, things didn't, you know, get better right away, but I noticed how I had to start focusing on, you know, not letting an alcoholic's problems affect my life. I, I had to, you know, learn how to work around that and, and focus on myself and, and, you know, continue to better myself, even though things weren't perfect with my parents and my relationship with my parents. And I noticed how, um, my behavior started to change and my relationships with, you know, not, not only my parents, but my friends got better. I, I learned how to 
how to treat people, how to deal with people, how to respect people, and, and how to accept that not everybody is going to, you know, do what you want all the time. Um, and that was tough for me because, you know, I mean, it's, it's really easy to try and manipulate people, um, and, and, you know, wallow. I, I did a lot of wallowing in my, my own self pity and, and denial. Um, I felt bad for myself. I, you know, I, I have an abusive dad and I, you know, I, I didn't know what to do about it. And, um, I mean, Alateen, Alateen really changed things for me. Um, I now have kids my own age that I can call, um, that show up for me, um, that understand what I'm going through when I'm going through it. And, you know, I have the wonderful sponsors that, you know, they're obviously there every meeting, but, you know, uh, they, they truly have helped me change my life. And, um, you know, um, I'm forever grateful for that. And, uh, thanks for letting me share. Well, my name is Francis, and I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon. And I want to thank uh, Bill for inviting me to be a, a speaker. He called me a couple of months ago before I hurt my foot and um, asked me if I would speak. And um, it's, it's a real privilege to do that. And I want to thank Eric for the beautiful basket that he brought to my room. It was huge. It has a lot of stuff in it. It's really pretty. And it has... Lots of goodies. And uh, Stan is just a wonderful woman. I've known her for a long time, and and um, she said some really nice things. So thank you, Stan. She's a wonderful woman. There's a lot of wonderful people in this program, and she's one of them. But, um, you know, they say that we attract alcoholics as al and I'm going to give you an example. I was in a meeting about in the early 90s, well, I was on my way to a meeting at the Alano Club in Salt Lake City. And it was probably about this time of the year. It was dark. And um, when you're walking up to the Alano Club, you can see the stairs. They leave the door open. You can see the stairs open and the light on to the AA room. And this drunk man walked up to me, and he said, Ma'am, can I ask you a question? I said, Sure. He said, I'm looking for the Alano Club. Can you tell me where it is? I said, You're standing right in front of it. And... Um, he said, well, I have to go to a meeting. I said, all you have to do is just walk up those stairs, and you can see the light. Just go in, and you'll be, you'll be right there. He says, right here? I said, yeah, this is the Alano Club. And he said, and I'm really scared. He said, will you, will you walk with me in there? And I said, okay. So he puts his arm out like this, and I said, no, 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 I'm not going to be taking your arm. So we walk up the stairs, and I said, okay, this is the room. There were probably about 140 people there. Um, and I start walking into the al room. They're kind of attached. And all of a sudden, he yelled, hey, ma'am, will you wait for me after the meeting? <laughs> and so <laughs> Jerry Kay stood up, and she said, don't worry, folks, she attracts them. <laughs> so I do. I, I attract alcoholics. Um, so that's a little bit of history. I'm kind of at rock bottom out Al Anon. And um you'll soon see that in just a few minutes. <laughs> so I'm gonna go back and give you a little bit of my history from my childhood. I was born in southern Colorado, um, around Durango. In fact I was born in a hospital in Durango. Uh, back in the mountains. We were kind of hill Hispanic hillbillies back then. My family had been in those mountains for about four hundred years. And um my uncles, you know, they had their own still, probably built them during Prohibition, don't know. Um, but they drank out of, you know, if they were in public, they drank out of a paper sack, and they drank out of mason jars sometimes, this clear liquid. So, you know, I, I, it was just part of my culture. Drinking was part of my culture. They made their own wine. Um, they, they were from Spanish-speaking communities. And we left there when I was three years old. Um, I'm, I was born Catholic. And, you know, I really believe that when I was born, I was a perfect child, one of God's children. I think that we all are. And I think it's through God's grace that any of us have a seat in this room tonight. Um, because it's not because of what we know why we're here. It's because God's grace has brought us here. And I really believe that. Anyway, um, my parents... 
moved to you to salt lake city when i was three and uh, when i was five years old we went back to colorado every year of my life it's, i spent my summers there but when i was five years old i, I was a little flower girl in a wedding and uh, the Catholic Church, they would sometimes hide their problem priests up in the mountains. So they would put them back in, in the hills back there where, you know, they couldn't, um, where people wouldn't know about what they were doing. And um, anyway, he had been drinking, and, and we were had been, been doing some practicing. Anyway, I ended up alone with this priest, and, and there was some overt abuse that took place. It's not part of al but it's part of my story. And that's where I started this dark path of alcoholism. And um, that same summer, we had been at my aunt's home, and they, we were, they were cooking some things. And I was a curious little girl, probably not well at the time either because of what had happened. But um, it was this big, they had a big kettle on the stove, and it had some lard and some flour in it. They were making a roux to do some thickening. And I had poured that on my face. My father said my skin just peeled off of my face and um, onto my hand. So, you know, when I started school, I was already a strange child because abuse will make you a strange and weird person. And then I, you know, I had this malady about me. I had this um, burn on the side of the face and hand. And, and so I was a strange child. You know, I started down that dark road um, of alcoholism. And then I began, you know, my uh, molding as in alcoholism through my parents. Um, my father, he would drink, and he he was a welder. He'd get paid every two weeks, and and so my, I started getting my Alanonism, my molding from my mother. So my father, he would get paid, and he'd drink. You know, after on Friday night after work, he'd go get drunk and. My mother would wait for him, but she wouldn't. My mother never said anything bad about my father uh, when she was waiting for him. We would all wait for him to come home. And, um, you know, my dad, my mother, she just sat in, in this cold, um, dark silence. She was very angry, but she was very cold about it. And one night in particular, my father pulled in and he passed out in the driveway. And I ran out, you know, to the car to see why he wasn't coming in, and I thought he had died. He was passed out on the steering wheel. I went back in the house, started yelling, you know, Dad's dead, and they all started laughing at me um, because he had passed out, and, you know, I just remember feeling a lot of shame about that, um, being ashamed that I had felt, you know, that I had found him and thought he was dead. Uh, but So I started to understand, you know, I started to learn how to do this thing called, you know, the silent treatment, because my mother was really good at it. And uh, my father, what he would do is, he would do one of two things. He would either buy her love back, or he would um, or he would turn us against her. So my father would turn his, his behavior onto my mother, because my mother really was the angry one, and she wasn't the nice one. So, you know, she always became the bad person. So I started to learn how to behave this way, you know, how to become an Al-Anon. Um, by watching my family. And, um, you know, um, there were times when my father, you know, he would spend a lot of that paycheck, and then before those next two weeks would, would come up, we would be hungry because there wouldn't be enough money. And so, um, you know, that that's I just kind of learned that that's the way it was. That's the way that we behaved. And... Um, this went on for a lot of years in my life. Uh, whenever we'd have big family parties, you know, everyone would drink, and they would drink a lot. And there was always a lot of inappropriate behavior. See, and I learned a lot of inappropriate things way too early in my life. And uh, and that's how I started to become, you know, an Al-Anon in training. Um, anyway, my parents moved to Seattle, Washington, and they took us to Seattle during the Boeing crunch, and my father, he still continued with his drinking, you know, he'd drink Saturday night, my mom would still be waiting for him, you know, and, and we'd go through that whole thing, it was just something that we did over and over and over again, you know, dad, she'd get this, he'd get the silent treatment, and she always had really nice things, my mom always had really nice things, even though we were poor, but you know, that's why my father got back into her good graces, and uh, anyway, my mother, she when I was 16, she got pregnant, 
and my father had been out. You know, he'd been doing his thing. And um, she went into labor, and she was so mad at my dad, she took the bus to the hospital to have the baby. So, um, you know, I just started learning these things, you know. I just learned to be self will just by watching my mother. My mother was a very controlling woman, and she was very angry, and, you know, we always did everything that she said. Um, she was really a wonderful woman because the things that I do today, I really believe it's because of my mother's strength, and I was able to get through that um, in Al-Anon. And I did a lot of therapy. I did seven years of therapy. There's a page in the, um, in the ODAP book that some that say that some of us have to do that, and I'm just one of those people in Helen on that had to do a lot of therapy. Anyway, um, we finally came back to Salt Lake City, but before we came back, uh, something happened, and I didn't really understand this. I, I did a fifth step about seven years ago in a thorough six and seven and really started to understand my behavior, and I started taking responsibility for my actions because, you know, in Al Anon, you can go to therapy for many, many years. You can figure out, you know, here's all the pieces of your life, but you never have to take responsibility for your actions. But in Al-Anon, you know, we have to take responsibility, and that's why it works. Anyway, um, I was walking home from school, and there was this Afro-American kid back in the 60s that had a crush on me, and um, my mother was quite prejudiced. But, you know, I, I wasn't really interested in him. We were walking home from school. I, a girlfriend was with me, and... We're walking down the street, and I see my mother watching us. You know, she's there at the window, and I can just see her. She's just watching us come down the street. And sure enough, when I walk in the door, she's just livid, you know. He went his way, and me and my girlfriend stood there, and she said, you know, how, what do you think the neighbors are going to think with you walking down the street like that? And, you know, I was okay. I was just okay that day. And all of a sudden, it just dawned on me that my mother, you know, was I was in control, and she was out of control, and I learned how to have control over my mother through men, and, which was not a good thing, you know. That was not a good thing. But that's where it started. Uh, we went back to Salt Lake City. I didn't want to go. I was at, um, doing really well in school, and, and she wouldn't let me stay because I did, you know, I did a lot of work for my mother. The only way that I, I got my mother's love was to clean the house. And so, you know, I would cook and clean for her, and then she would not be so hard on me. And I did not want to come, come back to Utah. But I came, and, you know, I did, I, I got pregnant because he, my mother did not like him. He had this 1957 Shiv with white leather seats, <laughs> and he didn't have a job. And she would always say to me, you know, where does he work? And... Uh, who cared where he worked? He had a nice car. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, I ran, I ran away from home. Um, he, was an acid, he was an acid freak, and acid made him really um, hostile. And it, not, it was not a good deal. We ended up divorced. I had two children from him. And then I started my first geographical. I went back to Seattle, Washington. And um, I had this pattern in, in my pattern for how I choose men was written by Carly Simon, and she said, you know, the song, he walks into a party like he's walking onto a yacht, all the girls think, want to be his girlfriend, you know, and he watches himself walk by, and he's out with another uh, man's wife, you know, doing things he shouldn't be doing, and that's exactly the way that I chose my men, the husbands that I had. Um, anyway, so I got divorced, went to Seattle, and... Um, actually, when I met my first husband, I met him through some girlfriends, and they said, oh, look, there's him. And, you know, and there he was, you know. The girls were all talking about him. So that happened with my second husband. We went to a dance one night, and, and he walked in, and all the girls were saying, ah, there he is, you know. And, and then, of course, I married him, and, and he was an alcoholic, and it didn't go well, and I um, had had such a bad deal with the first husband. You know, I came back to Salt Lake City for my second geographical, and then I got married again to the man that brought me. He's not my current husband, but to the man that brought me to this program. And he um, was an alcoholic, and he was also a drug dealer. And so my life got really interesting, and it went, it got really bad, but it didn't get bad until I got to Al-Anon. 
So with him, um, you know, I started to, um, I was just, had a horrible obsession with him. And it was really difficult because um, I couldn't divorce him because he was number three and I hadn't, I wasn't 30 years old. And I got to tell you, I didn't think that that was odd for a long time in recovery that I had been married three times before I was 30. So um, anyway, he would uh, party. He loved to, to drink, and he'd go out on Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. Saturday night, he'd come home Sunday morning because he was, good, he was a good Catholic. He was, you know, that was just his way. And so, you know, I was really quite obsessed, and, and I started having... Um, I'd wait for him. You know, I'd learn how to wait. So I would wait for him. I'd keep his dinner warm in the oven. And we started doing what I call the dance of death. He would call in the evening and he would say, um, I'll be home in 20 minutes. I'm having a few drinks. I'll be home in 20 minutes. So, you know, I'd go back and I'd start waiting. And pretty soon, you know, that was at 7 o'clock. Pretty soon it was 10 o'clock. And then it was 11 o'clock. And by then, you know, the rage is building and the anger. And then... The phone would ring, and it would be him, and he would say, hi, I'm sorry, you know, I'll be home in 20 minutes, and by, um, so, you know, I'd hang up the phone, and 20 minutes would go by, he wasn't there, it would be midnight, and then the obsession would, by then I would just be angry, and the obsession would set in, and you know, I did a lot of things, you know, I put my nose up to the window, um, I went looking for him on a 10 speed at 2 o'clock in the morning when I, because he had my car, I didn't get very far, and, um, you know, I, I did a lot of checking on him. I did a lot of waiting. One night he came in, and uh, I was waiting for him at the door, and he said, you know, he'd walk in the door, and I'd start doing my al thing, start complaining about where he'd been, why he doesn't come home, and blah, 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 and he said, oh, good night, Irene, and I started pounding his chest saying, don't call me your girlfriend's names. And he said, it's the same, Francis. It's the same, you know. Um, so I was just, I was just crazy. Um, we did this for a lot of years, probably um, for you know the first four years of our marriage, five years, maybe six. I, don't, I can't even remember. We would play this game of you know he would make the phone call. It never dawned on me not to answer the phone. I just would always answer the phone because I'm a good little Al-Anon, right? You always answer the phone. Uh, sometimes I just wish he was dead. He would come home. You know, I'd worry that he was going to die, and then he'd show up, and then I'd be angry because he was still alive. And I was just nuts. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I I didn't sleep very much because he would come in like at 3 or 4, 6 o'clock in the morning, and I'd go to work, and... and um, I had to get rid of the horror of the night, and the way that I did that was with makeup. And I was really obsessed with the dark circles I had under my eyes. I can remember how important it was every morning. I'd sit in front of that mirror, and I didn't do it because I thought, because I wanted to look good. I did it because I didn't want anyone to know that I, you know, that I was never sleep, that I wasn't sleeping. I was just having a terrible, terrible time. I became a terrible insomniac over that. Um, during those years, and, you know, we, we did a lot of things. Some nights, uh, he would pull in, and, you know, he would turn the car off, so he knew I'd be waiting for him. He'd turn the car off and roll, and I can remember, I can hear the tires <laughs> against the ground. <laughs> you know, he's sneaking in, and I'm listening for him to, you know, to get in there, but, boy, it was just horrible. We just had that, obs- I had that obsession with him, um, and... My job, I worked for a big corporation. I stayed with them for 35 years. But um, they had chosen me around you know, the time just before Alan on. They had chosen me to participate in this huge deal that they did. They had hired a man by the name of Hans Sager to come in, and he had done like the 10 steps to successful managing or something. Anyway, there were two not non-management people that were invited to the seminars, and I was one of them. So for a while there, for during these seminars, you know, um, God, they were teaching me things about living, and God, I started to just hit a bottom because I was living this lie and, you know, pretending like I wasn't. I would go to work, and I'd pretend like I wasn't living this lie. And, and um, at the end of these seminars, I had a big breakfast one morning, and I was supposed to be there at 7.30 in the morning, and he had been out. It was six, you know, he had the car. I didn't have a car. 
And um, anyway, he rolled in, and I had gotten up, did my thing with my makeup, you know, had a nice dress on. Went out to the car, and he was loaded, and he drove me to the Hilton Hotel and dropped me off. And, you know, I got, in, I got into that place, and I couldn't walk in there. I just couldn't. I started to cry. And so I just left. I caught the bus home, changed my clothes, and went to work. And, um, you know, they, my boss came in at 10 o'clock in the morning, and she said, you in my office. And I thought for sure they were going to fire me. And something happened that morning. I just decided I was going to tell the truth. And so I told her the truth. I told her I was the one with a man who was a drug dealer and that um, he was drinking and using all the time and I couldn't sleep and I was crazy. And uh, she made me an appointment to see the corporate psychologist. And she was the psychologist from hell. And she did not like al -Anons. I went into her office and I told her about him. And she told me I had to go to al -Anon. And I can remember thinking, yeah, I'm sure that's going to fix our problems. Um... So I went back to work, and they said, did you make another appointment? And I said, no. And they said, well, you have to, because if you want your job, you're going to continue, you know, with this going to treatment. So I go back. I make my next appointment. She she said, did you go to an Al-Anon meeting? And I said, no. And she said, you know, if you don't go to an Al-Anon meeting, Francis, I am not going to see you, she said, because you're untreatable. And she said, you know, if Francis, I want to tell you, if there was an Al-Anon um, institution in the state of Utah or within our 14 state region, she said, you would be there. She said, but there's not. But she said, you will go to Al-Anon or I will not see you. So I I didn't go. I, I didn't go. I had the packet there. I didn't throw the packet away. That was kind of odd. I think about that. I didn't throw the packet away. And um, anyway, one morning at 6 o'clock in the morning, it was a Saturday morning, a lady knocked at my door and I looked out at her. And I knew she wasn't there to have coffee with me. And I opened the door, and she said, you know where your husband is, Francis? And I said, I thought, no, and I'm sure you're going to tell me, and she did. That's what got me to my first Al-Anon meeting. And, you know, when I went to that meeting, I just felt okay. I went to my first Al-Anon meeting, and I can't tell you really what happened. I just believe it was the language of the heart. And, um, and so I started to go to Al-Anon because I liked it. Um, I started to feel a little better. I didn't feel quite so alone because, you know, when you're living in that situation, you, you start, I started to isolate quite a bit and um, just really didn't have anybody to talk to. And, you know, I just, um, I cried a lot. And I thought I was sad, but I found out I was just really rageful and angry. And the only way that it could come out was through tears. Anyway, you know, things would get worse before they ever got better. And God's timing of getting me to this program really made a huge difference. I met a lady by the name of Louise B., and um, she was my first Al-Anon sponsor. She came up to me, she gave me a, an ODAT, and she took my number, and she called me. And she would call me and see to see how I was doing, and I would, you know, tell her what was going on. And she did this really wonderful thing for me. She would talk about steps one, two, and three, and never call them steps one, two, and three. So we would talk about what I was upset about. And we would talk about my powerlessness over what was going on in my home and, and the drugging and, the, and you know, the um, people that were coming and going. And then we would talk about what I could do. And uh, then she would ask me, you know, if I'd clean my house. You know, she started making me do things and, and live in today. And she did with that to me all of the time. Louise saved my life because she gave me a foundation for this program that has never changed. She absolutely put um, the idea of what step one, two, and three is all about, and, and she made me live the, those three steps. You know, there was a lot of things that I had to do. Um, I had to um, say the serenity prayer a lot during the day because I was just crazy. I just, you know, I was having such a difficult time, and um, and didn't know whether I should leave him or stay. That was my big deal. You know, should I go? Should I stay? Some days my heart would say to go, and my head would say to stay, and then it was just the opposite. You know, I had this inner battle, and um, one of the reasons that I wouldn't go is because of her, and I wasn't going to let them get over on me, so I was going to make it easy for him. So I just continued to torture myself by staying in the marriage. 
And, um, you know, I, I got crazy in Al-Anon. Those first three years were just not, I didn't have a lot of wellness. I had monitoring equipment at work. And uh, one day I barged into his line and listened to his conversation, and I didn't like what I heard. So I called Kathy S. in Allen, and she said, Friends, do you remember that meeting that we talked about self-hatred? And I said, yeah. And I'm like, oh, gosh, you know, I just hate this. You know, why are they telling me these things? Uh, the psychologist would say, to, say things to me like this, Francis, why do you, why do you, what is it about you that makes you think you have to be with some, someone like that? And, you know, I would just think, you know, wh- what? You think I like this? I said that. Do you think I like this? And she said, yeah, I think you do, Francis. And, you know, it took me a lot of years to figure out what she was trying to tell me. And uh, we had a lot of problems. He went from, um, he loved cocaine, and eventually he went to heroin. And when he went to heroin, uh, large amounts of money started to disappear. And I would get um, calls from the people who were supplying him. And, you know, they would look for him. They, they would come slowly. I, they would come to the door, and then they'd go away and ask for him. They'd come to the door, and then they'd go away. And then this one night I got a call. And the man said, um, we're looking for your husband. And I said, well, you know, I don't know where he is. I rarely see him. He's always gone. And he said, you know, you have small children in your home, and he owes us a lot of money. So the next time that he arrived at home, because he would disappear for days at a time, I told him, I said, look, we have three vehicles in this home. If you don't take care of this business, I'm gonna, if the man comes again, I'm giving him all the keys. I'm giving him all my jewelry, all the money that I have or you take care of it, and he did. But we had quite a few of those situations before um, before we divorced, and it got really scary. I, I'd go to my father-in-law's house and stay some weekends because I was too afraid to be at home with my children. And, um, you know, I just had that battle, that horrible, horrible battle. Should I go or should I stay? And this was the problem. Um, you know, I thought, he's sick. You know, he's a sick man. You're going to leave a sick man? And then, you know, was it sickness or was it evil? You know, I, I had to make that distinction before I could go. And eventually, um, you know, I was able to do that. But, and, you know, and I prayed and I had to work the slogans and I had to make phone calls and I had to rely on the program and I had to do what I was told and I had to drive differently. Some nights when I'd come home from a meeting, I didn't want to um, um, see if he was, you know, in one of the places that he hung out because then I would just be obsessed for the night. So I started to drive home differently. I would take different routes. You know, I just kept trying those things. And you know what I did one night? I just stopped answering the phone. Um, I just unplugged the phone and I went to sleep. I thought, how friends, why did you just unplug the phone three years ago? You would have slept a lot better. But you know, I, I mean, you know, you don't think about those things when you're obsessed, when you're crazy. You're not thinking about not answering the phone. You're thinking about keeping the, you know, the obsession going. And, um, you know, so I had to try a lot of things. And, uh, finally, uh, he went into treatment. And we really hadn't had any kind of relationship with each other for quite, almost a year, I would say, or eight, eight months because it's just not fun to have a relationship with somebody who is using heroin. <laughs> they don't smell very good. But anyway, um, this partic- he got out of treatment, and um, we decided we would give, give it one more try. And, you know, I just couldn't have children. I had two boys, and then I never had children. And, and I just I didn't have to take any contraceptives this one night. For some reason, I got pregnant. And... Um, and, you know, my doctor gave me some choices, but I couldn't live with the choices. So I just decided to keep the baby. And, and, um, when I had her a year later, um, something happened to me. I was, you know, I had worked my program and worked it and worked it and worked it and decided that I was just going to do the best that I could with what I had. And I went to the grocery store one night and it was raining I remember the night really well because something happened to me that that evening. And I pulled up and he was there. And when he saw me, he drove away. And I already had an idea of what was going on. And um, 
So I went into the store and I did what Al-Anon told me to do. I just put one foot in front of the other, went in, did my business. And when I got home, he was there. And, you know, something changed inside of me. It was like Bill W. talks about. I had this spiritual awakening and the obsession was, it was gone. And I just knew that he was incapable of telling the truth. And I also did what Elanon told me to do. Elanon told me that if I was going to leave, that I had to do it when things were good, not when they were bad. And I waited for the time to be right. And one morning I asked him if he would just let me go. Because he was a powerful man. When we went out together, you know, there was always someone watching over me. Um, if we went to a club, there was always a goon seated, sit, seated next to me. And so he said that he would let me go. And um, I made enough money through my job for Thanksgiving in December to move on, and I was able to get my own apartment. The hard part about leaving is I had two sons, and one of them stayed. He wouldn't, I couldn't get him to go with me, and he was left behind. Um, so I started this new life, and, and I was doing okay. I couldn't get money from him. Um, my sponsor told me, she said, Francis, I want you to do something. She said, I want you to live off of the money that you make and and live within your means. And if he gives you any kind of child support, I want you to think of it as a gift. And, you know, that helped me so much because then I just didn't have to be crazy about him not giving me money. So I, I learned to live within my means. And um, I started my service work. This is where I started service. I was an Alateen sponsor for six years. You know, I helped, uh, was part of the um, first Al-Anon conference, worldwide conference. I got to be a participant in that during this time. Uh, I met my third husband, my fourth husband. <laughs> <laughs> and he was in the program. But as a, an odd thing happened to me, I went into what I call spiritual con constipation in my recovery. <laughs> and... Um, if you've ever suffered from it, you'll know what it's like. It's when you go to meetings and you can't, you know, you're not hearing the message anymore. The words are just words. You read, I would read pages and they were just pages. And, uh, it, that became a real difficult marriage. And that was my part in it. You know, I just, I was doing a lot of service work. I spoke at two conferences in Spanish. I did my, the Spanish speaking meetings. I did a lot of, uh, PI. In, you know, I did a lot of public information, loved public information, went to schools, we did radio, we did a lot of, um, did a lot of service work. And I think that that's what got me through that marriage. We ended up getting a divorce and he passed away and my mother and him passed away within a short time of each other. And you know, that was really hard when my mother died, even though we had made peace, even though my mother and I had fought for so many years, we made peace in this program because of the gift of, of, um, recovery. And, you know, I did some fourth steps. I'm telling you, the fourth step was hard. My four, my first fourth step was so hard. It was hard to write that piece of paper. It took a few years for me, maybe five, seven years for me to realize that, you know, it, the fourth step wasn't that difficult because it was just me and a piece of paper. It was the fifth that I should have been afraid of. And I did a fifth step, um, and a lot of those early four steps were like confessions. You know, I was talking about things that I had stolen and um, affairs that I had had. And uh, they, they were just confessions. I really wasn't learning about what my problem or my pattern was. And so um, I didn't know. I did, really didn't work a six or seven back then. I did a lot of service work. I just, you know, I was still working the steps. I would read every day and had a good sponsor. Joni H. was my sponsor at the time and a brilliant woman in Al-Anon. And um, uh, he passed away, and then my mother died, and I kind of let go of service because I just, you know, it just got hard. And um, Joni H., she said, I go to Crested Butte quite often. I've been going for almost 20 years. They have a big conference there that runs for a week. And Joni H., um, the year that he died, I didn't, I couldn't go to meetings when he died, and I was so angry at AA. It was just angry. <sighs> I was just angry at AA. But God brought fellowship to me because I was working, um, in 2002, we had, you know, the Olympics, and I worked with the Olympics for two years through my corporation. And, you know, 
I was part of the drug and alcohol program with my corporation by then, and they brought program people to Utah, and those people took care of me. They called on me. They checked on me. We had meetings without me knowing it. You know, just on the slide, we'd go for a walk, and they were, you know, doing their 12-step work with me. And Joni H., she told me I needed to get to Crested Butte, so I drove myself to Crested Butte that summer. And I heard everything I needed to hear for me to get back into recovery the way that I needed to. And, uh, and then I met my husband. We, he, I met him at Chris Butte. He's a wonderful man. Um, we did a workshop together and I liked him. He wasn't my pattern. Uh, I didn't know my pattern when I met him, but he wasn't my pattern. He, he was just, we, we sat down together before that, uh, workshop and we talked and, he kept making fun of me and teasing me, and uh, I just liked him. And I just kind of li- I liked the person that he was. And so, a couple of years later, I, I did a thorough fifth step and found out, you know, that pattern that he walked into a room. And he, you know, he didn't walk into the room. He was just another person. One of the problems that I have with relationships is that after about two years, well, you know, I never bring Francis into the relationship. I bring the person that I think you need me to be. And then two years later, I'm so tired of being this, you know, this person that I have to be myself and then things don't go well after that. And so, you know, I, I had to learn that about me. I had to learn what it was about Francis, like the psychologist had said, what is it about you, Francis, that makes you think that you need to be with someone like him? And it had nothing to do with him. Um, after I did that fifth step with my sponsor, I did a thorough six and seven, and I'm telling you, I did those two steps for two years, and I learned so many things. I, I started to pray about having judgments about those husbands and uh, about them being husbands and fathers, trying to let go of my judgment of that. And a lot of really wonderful things came through, some things that I'm not really proud of. One of them was with my youngest son, and what I learned was that I had hated his father through him. And um, it was real difficult. That was a real hard thing for me to come to terms with. And um, by then it was too late because he's, he was already on his way to alcoholism. Um, he's not in the program, but I think he's been sent to the program. We don't talk, and I'm sure that this is something that God is eventually going to have to take care of. Uh, but I pray a lot about that because I know that, you know, that's something that God's going to have to help me with. Um, but it's just part of, you know, what I was back then. I, I'm, like I said, I'm not proud of that, but it's what happened. And um, a lot of wonderful things have happened in the program for me. I, I talk about, you know, the difficulties and, you know, things that I had to learn and the relationships that I had. But I worked for 35 years. I wanted to go to school those years. You know, I, I was the mother that took care of everything. I was afraid of getting fired. I did everything the psychologist told me. And then 10 years after she sent me to al they didn't need a corporate psychologist anymore. And we went to dinner, and she said, you know, Francis, I need to make an amends to you. And I said, okay. And she said, you know, when you first came into my office, she said, I thought you were the craziest woman I had ever met in my life. She said, and I didn't believe a word you told me. And she said, I just want to apologize for, you know, for that. And... um Anyway, she was, you know, it, it was just one of those things where things keep coming back to you in the program. I, I had a lot of God things happen. And so I worked for 35 years in this corporation. Uh, I was able to keep my job. Um, you know, I had a lot of really good jobs. I worked with a lot of people. Had a lot of envy about people being able to go to school and work. I couldn't. I, I had two boys at home and then a daughter. Um, you know, at the end of my career in 2008. I got offered a lot of money to leave, and um, I was able to go to school for three years. Um, back in the 90s, my aunt, she's a um, folk artist um, with the um, Salt Lake Arts Council, and I just, she she would kind of rescue me from the difficulties of my home when I was a child, so I, I would go help her when she was working with the Arts Council, and I did an apprenticeship with her, and then I became a folk artist because of my aunt just doing one of those things that the program talks, you know, 
talks to us about making, you know, going back and doing what we need to do with people. Well, I went to school, and I didn't really didn't know what I wanted to do after I, I retired from my corporation. I, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And um, I started going to school, and um, I decided I would take a yoga class. I would take it Tuesday and Thursday at 7.30 in the morning. But what I found was that when I took, when I practiced yoga, that towards the end, you know, the, my days were better. So, you know, I, I kind of looked at the yoga program, and, you know, I'm in my 50s, and I decided I would take the, their teacher training program. And um, took my first class and with a lot of young people. And, you know, I just kind of hung in there and was able, and I got my certificate and and I went to, uh, I thought I would teach people 60 and over. And I volunteered at a senior center to work, just work with women for free. And uh, when I got my certificate, I started getting phone calls. And before, I, you know, I had more work in yoga than I've ever wanted in my life. I te teach eight classes a week. And I guess what I'm trying to tell you is that there's promises in this program. that You'll have a life that you never thought you could have. You know, my husband, we did another workshop a couple of years ago, and, and we decided that we would try a relationship. And, and you know, we, we eventually got married, and we pray together. And things aren't perfect, but, you know, it's, we have this daily prayer, and we make our bed together every morning until I hurt myself. And, uh, you know, it seems like when we pray, we can work things out. There's nothing that... Nothing big ever really gets out of hand. It's it's really been a nice gift, um, and and I'm just really grateful for my husband. He's a you know he's just somebody I just didn't think I could ever be with. When I first met him that many years ago, back in 2003 or four, whatever it was, I didn't think that him and I had anything in common. We have a lot in common. Um, and you know, before I go, I want to tell you about my mother. My mother, when I was the third daughter born out of seven children, and, and, you know, she was depressed when she had me. And so we had a lot of difficulties, my mother and I. And she um, she couldn't take care of me, and there were these four women, sisters, that used to take care of me. And uh, when I was between the ages of, um, from birth to three, to the time I turned three, these women actually did a lot. They took care of me. My mother couldn't, she didn't, she couldn't love me. She couldn't take care of me because of her depressions. And then after I had started walking that dark road of um, alcoholism, you know, she just really didn't like me, which is okay. You know, I've made peace with that. But I had to work through my higher power stuff is really hard. You know, if you've ever been abused by the clergy, it makes spirituality almost impossible. I mean, I knew that there was a God out there, but I didn't think that God loved me. And the one thing that I learned from that fifth step was that I had no self-worth. And, you know, eventually I just didn't feel like I was a worthy person. And um, anyway, you know, every time I'd meet up with these women, they would tell me about my childhood, and they'd tell me how they would take care of me. And, and um, you know, it, that happened a lot. Well, uh, one of the women died this last year. Uh, she, and the morning that she died, I had this dream about her illness, you know, that was taking her life. And um, what I found was that day, what God told me that day was that, you know, God's love came through those women. It didn't come through my mother. And it didn't have to come through my mother because it doesn't matter what kind of love you have. When you have the love of God, it doesn't matter where you come from or where you've been. It will, you will know that God loved you when you start to understand that it was God's love that got you through everything that you ever did. I didn't need the love of my mother because I already had God's love. I just didn't know that. I fought it for years. For years, I hated my mother. I had to, you know, we had to have our little come to Jesus session. And um, anyway, that's the story of my life <laughs> and my recovery. And I just want to thank you for allowing me to share my story with you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.